an incredible garden full of surprises just beyond these gates. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the Garden Home. This is such a special place. But you know, thousands of people pass by here every week and they have no idea what lies beyond these garden walls. But today, I want to share a glimpse of some of the enchantment and beauty that this garden has to offer. As a garden designer, I find I'm drawn to those gardens that have a strong architectural framework where the design of the garden becomes a series of garden rooms or spaces, as though the house itself has been folded outside where you create more living space. This garden is a beautiful example of this concept. Now, over the years, I've discovered there are 12 principles of garden design that if used properly can create beautiful living spaces. This garden certainly reflects all 12 of those principles, but we can't cover them all in today's show, so I thought we'd focus on three of them. First, enclosure. And second, how enclosure then spills into mystery, and how mystery can give way to the third, whimsy. But first, let's learn a little bit about the history of this fantastic place. This is the old orchard house in Carmel, California. But to understand this special place, you must first look outside its walls to the Carmel Mission situated next door. You see, the home and garden of the old orchard house were once integral parts of the mission complex. Today, it's the home of the mission curator, Sir Richard Men. This mission was founded back in the 18th century in 1770 by Father Junipero Serra. It was the second mission to be built in the extensive California chain of missions. It's considered by many to be the most beautiful of all the missions Father Sarah founded. A visit to Carmel's Central Coast today is a testament to the favorable weather for growing crops year-round. These conditions allowed the mission to be self-sufficient, producing fruits and vegetables for the mission community. Way back at the end of the 18th century, this garden was part of an orchard. You see, there was an orchard house here associated with the mission and the orchard itself, and it was completely walled. You see, it was to keep the wild animals from coming in and eating the pears. Today, this space, or the old orchard, is now much reduced, but there is a wall around the entire property, which gives it this feeling of intimacy and seclusion. That's the marvelous thing about enclosure. Now, you can apply enclosure in a lot of different ways. A simple picket fence across the front of a house, a wall or a hedge, or even a building can be the beginning of creating an enclosed garden. Here in this garden, they've used several devices to create this sense of intimacy and space, all providing the framework of the garden. There are hedges, they've used the backs of buildings, and even implied enclosure. Here they've created a colonnade, a series of classical columns with a lintel running across the top. This just simply implies a parameter or a border for this flower garden. Another aspect of this principle of design enclosure that I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up is the whole psychological dimension of it. You see, by being able to take a large garden and divide it into smaller pieces, then it just seems more manageable divide and conquer, if you will. In my own garden, if I didn't have this series of garden rooms to think about individually, and I had to think about the entire garden all the time as one unit, it'd be too overwhelming. Let me show you how I've broken my garden into a series of garden rooms around my home. Let's start with the front garden. This area runs north and south and provides me an opportunity to experiment with different types of plants in these English-inspired mix borders, which are full of old-fashioned roses, perennials, and annuals. Moving clockwise around the garden, we find ourselves in the fountain garden. The walls are clearly defined by this needlepoint holly hedge. 
And the entries are accented with an arbor made with columns, similar to the columns used on my front porch. Continuing the tour into the rondel or oval-shaped garden, we discover an ever-changing palette of blooms. In the spring, narcissi, tulips, and crab apples fill the air with a sweet perfume. Now the shape of this oval is repeated with a clipped boxwood hedge, giving the space its room-like feeling. Hidden behind the hedge is a vegetable garden where eight raised beds are home to herbs, flowers, and produce that changes with the seasons. If you stop by in the spring or fall, you'll discover my weakness for growing lettuce. To get to the shade garden, we move through the loggia, our covered breezeway connecting my garage to the house. We step onto a cut stone path that's flanked by beds of shade-loving plants. Rhododendron, foxglove, hostas, Solomon seal, and hydrangeas are all must-haves for me in this garden. Peering down the path is a mysterious clipped arch which beckons visitors to pass through to explore the rest of the shade garden which runs along the side of my house. Now an area I don't often show visitors is the service yard. You see this is a workspace that usually stays in a mess. This is where the compost is being churned out to amend the garden soil. Young seedlings are being started and new arrivals are being prepared for their place in the garden. A lath house situated on the side of my garage provides shelter for plants from cold winter temperatures and the hot summer sun. All of these individual garden enclosures provide variety and help me break the garden down into manageable spaces. You see, this idea of enclosure is universal and timeless. It applies in so many different applications. Now, this reminds me of a visit I made to Holland where I saw a beautiful vegetable garden that was completely enclosed and set apart from the larger landscape. Let's take a look. One of the things about this garden that I like so much is the element of surprise. Well, thank you. Yeah, I like the element of surprise. I mean, the sh garden should be a surprise when you turn a corner and see, ah! Oh. Yeah, and that's exactly what happened to me when I saw this. I had no idea you were going to have all this, this riot of color and bloom back here. It's really, really beautiful. And I have to tell you, I, I'd love to know what's beyond this hedge here. Well, in that case, we'll go and have a look. <laughs> I'll show you. Yeah. Okay, let's go and see yeah, the vegetable garden. So what do we garden. have in here? Oh my goodness, what a vegetable garden. <laughs> well, nice and flower it's... garden. Yeah, well, I tend to do everything in, uh, together. Just mix it all up. Yeah, That's it's right. more fun that way, isn't it? Look at this. You've got uh, all sorts of things. I love all these basils, and uh, you've got the love in a mist planted next to the beans, and it's great. Well, it's, it has a very good microclimate because of the hedges around yeah, sure, it. Right. it. It's so warm and nice in here. Like the classic walled garden in England with the tall walls. <laughs> Here secret again, garden. Yeah, yeah this right. is a secret garden. Yeah. yeah, and I like the way you've clipped the hedge and made an arch over the entry. Well, we even introduced another uh, entry because otherwise we had to go all around it every time. <laughs> right. So we just cut one in and that's only five years old. So it does grow quickly. It does, yeah. Bridget, even so late in the season, I mean, here it is at the end of August, you and Hank have so much in bloom. I mean, there's the, the Mexican zinnia or the tithonia in bloom and all these dahlias. Yeah, I love dahlias, don't you think? Yeah. And zinnias. Oh, they're exuberant. Yeah, well, and all the zinnias you've got. I mean, it's a flower arranger's dream. Well, I do dry them. I dry them in sand. I'm upside down and they come out really as nice as what you see here. The nice thing about this hedge is that it really sets all the colors off, it being so tall. Yeah, well, it must be about eight feet, and the uh, arch is probably 12. 12, I guess so, yeah. And one path just leads to the next through a gate, and here we go into yet another part of the garden. Now that you've been inside Bridget's vegetable garden, I bet you'd like to know what's on the other side of that hedge. Well, this leads me to my next principle of design, mystery. You see, we're all curious about what's around the bend, what's over the hedge, or what's over the fence. By creating a sense of mystery in a garden, you lure the visitor through it. The first rule is to never give it all away. 
you don't want to show the entire garden off at a first glance. That's where enclosure comes in. You can begin to see how enclosure and mystery begin to work together. So by having contained spaces that are enclosed where you can't see from one space into the other, it sets into motion intrigue. You become curious about what's around the corner. I have to say I find color to be very mysterious. As an artist, it mesmerizes me. It's astonishing the way it affects our moods and our feelings. Take the color red and blue. They affect us in opposite ways. For instance, red energizes us. Think of fire trucks and blood. There's a sense of urgency about red. Plants like cannas, red salvia, maverick geraniums, and those supersonic impatience, as well as crocosmia lucifer, will all arrest your attention in the garden. Now these are all reds that I consider to be orange reds or scarlet reds, the really hot reds. But there's a cooler side to red as well. I call these the blue reds. These are magentas and cerise colored flowers. Some of my favorites are some of the old fashioned roses in my garden, such as Russell's Cottage, Globe Amaranth, Coleus Molten Lava, a wide range of petunias, and Chrysanthemum Bold Felicia. Now reds are interesting in another way as well. Whether they're hot reds or cool reds, they can have the effect of creating shortened distance. They can make a space actually feel smaller. Now blue, on the other hand, has the opposite effect. It can make a space feel more expansive, like the sky or the ocean. Those are both expansive elements. Some of my favorite blue flowers are plumbago, agapanthus, pansies and violas, as well as salvias of all kinds. Blue evokes a feeling of tranquility. It really calms us down. It's one of my favorite colors. I love blue shirts, <laughs> and I use a lot of blue in my garden because my garden is really very small and the use of blue makes it feel much larger. Now, green also should be considered among those tranquil, soothing colors. Some of the most satisfying gardens I've ever experienced have been woodland shade gardens where the color green dominates. And one of the most tranquil gardens I've ever visited is the Chicago Botanic Gardens Japanese Garden. Doesn't it just make you feel restful and calm? You see, there is something mysterious about color and the way it makes us feel. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up gray as a part of green. You see, gray is one of those marvelous colors in the garden that harmonizes with everything. I love artemisias and lamb's ear, as well as Dusty Miller in the garden. And when you assemble lots of gray plants together, you can create a beautiful effect. Now the mystery of color doesn't have to be limited to just beds and borders. You can also use these ideas in container plantings. I've found that the key to any container is to follow a simple recipe. A tall spiky element in the center, something round and full to sort of fill it out in the middle, and then something to cascade. In this container I designed for shade, I've used a hosta in the center. Its leaves are bold and its flower spikes give me that spiky element I need. And then to round out and fill in the middle, I've used accent white impatience because it sparkles in dim light. So it's perfect for shady conditions or enjoying at night. And for the last element in the recipe, the cascading element, I've used two plants. The first is a variegated vinca major. It'll cascade almost to the ground from the top of the container. The other plant I chose to spill from the edge of the container is this purple sachet nemesia. It's a wonderful container plant with a sweet aroma and it'll bloom profusely throughout the summer. Simply put, to bring mystery into the garden is to embrace the unknown. Things we can't see or understand intrigue us. Just like this path I just came down. It's dark and shadowy in the woodland, but I can't see the destination point, and it makes me interested and curious about what lies beyond. Also, for me at least, things of great age are intriguing to me. They're a mystery. Take this fragment of a Roman temple, which was only recently installed in this garden. It's made to look like an ancient ruin. It certainly incited curiosity in me. And then there's water. 
which has its own mysterious quality. There's just something about the sound of it that soothes us. You wonder where it's coming from and where it's going. You know, water's a great way to have fun in the garden. Now let's take a look at a way to bring water into your garden home. I can't imagine my garden without the sound of water. My fountain garden provides this. But you know, a water feature doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be very simple and still be effective. Just take a look at this beautiful green glazed bowl I found. I'm going to make a water feature out of this by using just one of these little container fountain kits. You can pick them up at your local nursery. Now all I do is position this pump in the middle and I'm going to anchor it with some of these stones just by placing them around them like this. Now I'm going to position the fountain and the stones just slightly off center because I want to add a plant. I'm going to put this canna in here to help conceal the, the cord that will run across the back of the basin. Now cannas are an old fashioned plant that um, you know, we've grown in our gardens for a long time, since Victorian times, but they'll actually grow beautifully in standing water. And that's why I've chosen this beautiful striped leaf variety to go in the container. Now it's time to fill the basin with water. Now I'll take the water level up just below the top of the fountain spout. Or you can just follow the directions with the container fountain kit. All right, now with it full, I'm going to add water lettuce, one of my favorite water plants, across the top. I really like this plant. It multiplies so quickly, and I just love the way it floats on the water. I love the color. It's sort of a soft green that works really well with the color of the container. All right, with the lettuce in place, let's see how it works. You plug it in. Oh, there we go. This is so simple and so few ingredients. We've got a basin, we've got a pump, a few stones, two types of plants, and of course water. And that's it, presto. This will be beautiful sitting on a terrace or a patio or even on a table. And the sound of water, well you just can't beat that. Like the canna and the fountain I made, there are other plants we commonly grow in our gardens that make nice additions to water features. Bob Kirshner of the Chicago Botanic Garden tells us more about using these plants. I see some plants that home gardeners may know, like the cardinal flower that you've planted along the bank here, as well as some of the ornamental grasses. Aquatic plants aren't always necessarily known for the bright colors, except water lilies, of course. But the change in texture yes. and form of the leaves, I think, is very is especially important when it yeah. comes to aquatics. I think I think water gardening is really more about texture than it is about color. Often the aquatic plants don't have as many colorful flowers. Here's an exception to that, where we have Pontederia cordata yeah, or pickerel weed, weed with yeah. a beautiful purple flower on it. Uh, but we also work off the colors and the textures of the leaves themselves, variegated forms of iris. And a, and a chorus, and then up there, co the colocasias are a deep purple. So Bob, how did you become so interested in aquatics and, and water gardening? Well, there's a little interesting story with that, I guess. Uh, when I'm speaking with groups, trying to get them interested in water and talking about water gardening, I often ask them to close their eyes for a moment and imagine their favorite childhood memory. Uh, then they open their eyes and I ask them, how many of your memories involved water? And nearly everyone raises their hand. I would raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I spent my childhood camping on a lake up in northern Wisconsin, and I've been attracted to water ever since. And I think America in general is trying to bring a little piece of that mm. into their backyard with water gardens and ponds. Okay. We've seen in a garden home how all these different principles relate to one another. Earlier in the show, we talked about enclosure. You saw how enclosure can give way to mystery. And in mystery, we saw how water can lead us to whimsy, where we can have some fun. And I think you should have fun in the garden. It's a wonderful place to express a sense of humor and to show your own personal style. Why, in this very garden, this owner 
through his interest in history and architecture, has assembled some beautiful architectural fragments in a fantastic way. Now the gardens at the old orchard house next to the Carmel Mission in California are very elaborate in terms of taking a hobby and using it as ornament in the garden. So how about a more scaled down version of this idea? You see, model trains are the hobby of Carlton McMullen, and he's transformed his backyard garden into a playground for grown-up engineers. Carlton, when you first approach your house, you can't help but be taken by how harmoniously the house and the architecture fits onto the landscape. Well, that's what we love about it. You know, the house was designed by Faye Jones, who was a fellow of Frank Lloyd Wright, and the tendency is to use the natural resources like the wood, the flagstone, the glass, yes. the rock, to, to blend it in. And this is what we like about, about his design. It's wonderful, both inside and out. As a matter of fact, you can be on, on the outside walking around the house, and when you look, you can look right through the house the way it's, way it's sided, from one glass panel through another glass panel. And when you're in the house looking out into the garden, it feels like you are in nature. Well, it, it does. And when you're in the house and you're looking out, the Garden Railroad almost becomes a focal point because you can go into the big room in here and you're, in, you're surrounded by the Garden Railroad and you can even hear the waterfall. This idea of the garden home where you extend living space outdoors to enjoy nature really fits here. I would say this whole railroad display it would be the playroom of the garden. <laughs> So Carlton, how did you get into trains? Well, as a kid, I always wanted a train. I, frankly, I was disappointed because I couldn't make up my mind between uh, a train around a Christmas tree that had two rails versus three rails. I ended up not getting a train at all. But later on, during late in high school and during college days, I had an opportunity to work as a fireman on the, uh, on the Santa Fe. So you really got to experience trains firsthand. Well, this is quite an elaborate setup. It's just amazing. Well, you know, the fellow we had for design, Paul Bussey, is a master at this. He's done work at Chicago Botanical Gardens, New York Botanical Gardens, and you know, on and on. Well, I had the pleasure of seeing his work at the New York Botanical Garden uh, in a Christmas exhibition. Oh, that's tremendous. Uh, oh, it was just amazing. And he had created these marvelous houses, actually landmarks, New York landmarks, the Guggenheim Museum, many of the Hudson River Valley houses, and they were all a part of this miniature landscape. Can you imagine that he can take seeds and pods and leaves and twigs and vines and do all that, but when you look at when you look at this railroad, you're looking at old remnants of railroad ties. You're looking at willow on the bridges and trussels. If you come over and look at the covered bridge, you're looking at cypress bark for the roofing on that. And of course, beautifully designed. Yeah, you know, all all the rock came off of this property and we just moved it in and, and placed it around. I think the changes in elevation that he created with the railroad ties and the stones really adds to the whole experience. Oh, it, it does, and it's very purposeful on, on his part. When you create a railroad like this, a miniature railroad, you have to scale the plants down along with it, don't you? A lot, of, a lot of people do. Some people are really sticklers in terms of keeping the scale on the plants. In my case, I'm not being a stickler. I want a garden with a train that's running through it. So the plants can be out of scale, larger, but not too large. It's still got to fit. The tiny, tiny leafed conifers and ground covers and plants like that really fit in a landscape like yeah. this. They, they really do. I think the uh, element of water in this in landscape adds so much, as it does in every landscape, yeah. but yeah. Uh, it, it really uh, adds a dimension of, uh, of delight here. Uh, that's one of my primary requirements. The uh, trestles and bridges, how do you maintain those and keep them from deteriorating? Well, you know, the, the bridge and the trestles are, are well, so they bend, they hold up very well. But a couple of times a year, we do spray them with a clear sealer mm -hmm. so that they will, will hold water. up. water. Yeah. And if you look at these ties, these ties were actually laid on an industrial spur in 1957. So what, <clears throat> what remains 
obviously has weathered very well. And I think they'll be here another 20 or 30 years. Carlton, this has been such a treat. Thank you so much for sharing your garden railroad with us. My pleasure. Come and see me again. I'll do it. I can't wait to see the next installment. There will be one. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Creating a garden home is all about expanding our living space outdoors in creative ways. It's a way to bring beauty and wonder and some fun into our lives. From the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. What says welcome in the garden home? Well, it's entry, of course. I'll take you around my garden for ideas on how to create entries that will invite guests into your garden, as well as Charleston, South Carolina, where we'll meet a master craftsman whose ironwork is featured in the Smithsonian. Plus, we'll learn about the gates at this great American home.